Hello again everyone from Tokyo, Japan and welcome back to Japan Vintage Camera where today I'm going to be talking about this big bad boy here and this of course is the legendary Nikon F uh, but before I get started uh, talking about this camera I thought I'd make a quick public service announcement to announce uh, a new channel which I started just yesterday uh, this new channel is called Two Wheels in Tokyo and uh, in this channel I'm going to be uh, kind of taking advantage of my second favorite hobby here in Japan which is cycling and recording videos while I'm cycling. And this is for those people who watch my uh, channel here but are more interested in the Japan part than the vintage camera part. Uh, if you'd like to see these videos I'll post a link to my new channel in the description below the video. Uh, please pay a visit if you'd like to see it. And let's go ahead and continue with this video. So, uh, I know I've done some videos about Nikon cameras, and I've done one or two about the Nikon F in the past, but uh, this particular video is going to be focusing more on the history and development of the Nikon F, and why this became uh, the, I guess, the, the main workhorse camera for generations of professional photographers. Uh, the history of the Nikon F starts quite early, way back in 1955, and this camera was developed at the same time as Nikon's S3 and SP rangefinder cameras. Might be kind of odd or sound odd to develop, you know, these cameras. Uh, I guess three different models which actually compete against each other, but uh, Nikon had an idea, or I guess a a uh, a logic behind this idea. And uh, it was mainly they, they had hoped to perfect the rangefinder cameras in order to further perfect their soon to be uh, marketed SLR camera. Nikon, of course, began manufacturing uh, rangefinder cameras in the 1940s, and by the, the early mid 50s, they had pretty much perfected uh, their focal uh, plane shutter mechanism. And they decided that this would be a very good foundation uh, on which to base their SLR cameras. The Nikon S3 and SP had the most advanced of this uh, focal plane shutter, uh, which used a, a horizontal traveling curtains, a very simple and reliable system which worked very well in <clears throat> uh, uh, wild extremes of temperatures and such. And while perfecting the, the shutter mechanism in these cameras, when Nikon eventually marketed its SLR camera, it would have a very good foundation on which to base it whereas other uh, camera manufacturers at the time were largely working on ground-up designs. The basic idea of the Nikon F was to take an S3 or SP rangefinder camera, and that would be the back part here, and simply add a mirror box and reflex mirror, uh, reflex mirror and pentaprism to it, and allow through the lens, uh, I guess, a field of view and focusing. This was quite important because uh, photography was advancing and uh, new lens technology was making longer and faster lenses. And it was quite difficult to use telephoto lenses on rangefinder cameras. It was possible if you added a mirror box to the front of the camera with a prism which looked over the top of the body. And uh, a number of these systems were made uh, for, say, Leica cameras and Canon's rangefinder cameras. And while they worked quite well, uh, they were kind of difficult to set up and uh, it, they made the cameras kind of boxy and odd looking. And uh, though the lens performance was quite good, it was obviously going to be better if they simply made a complete uh, camera designed around uh, the single lens reflex system. And a number of manufacturers in Japan in the 1950s were working on this. Uh, the Exacta company had actually manufactured SLR cameras back in the 1930s. But uh, you know, the, the primitive design uh, of, of that particular camera and the technology available in those days made it not especially reliable and uh, certainly you know, not much of an improvement over the rangefinder cameras of the time. Nikon really wanted to make a solid camera, uh, one which would, uh, they hoped would dominate the market because their rangefinder cameras were doing quite well uh, with the press. Uh, they, they were kind of a, a hit when they were released, the S3 and SP, and uh, particularly the quality of the lenses which were uh, available for these cameras. And Nikon wanted to continue to make the highest possible quality camera and lenses. And by 1959, the design was completed, and it, the uh, Mitsukoshi department store in Nihonbashi, which is about, I don't know, about seven or eight kilometers from where I'm sitting right now, uh, they marketed the very first Nikon F bodies with a, a quick show in the department store. Now, Mitsukoshi is kind of an interesting uh, store here in Japan. It's the largest department store, and it has, uh, I guess, the distinction of being the, I guess, the second place in Japan to have a working telephone. 
and of course the first store of any kind to have a telephone. And it's kind of odd to be the second place in an entire country to have a telephone. There are not, not that many people to call when there are only two telephones in the country. But uh, that goes to show you uh, uh, the, the scale and uh, the supposed grandeur of this store. To be able to say that your store had one of the only working telephones in the country meant your store was uh, quite the serious thing. Uh, later on the same year, a second show was held at the Takashimaya department store, which is on the same street as Mitsukoshi, about one kilometer uh, up the block or so. And uh, Japan held its first camera show in 1960, and of course the Nikon F was displayed there as well. Uh, the cameras were very well received. They were quite expensive at the time, almost uh, 70,000 yen for a camera body and a basic lens. And that was uh, a lot of money in those days, more expensive than the rangefinder cameras. But people considered it a good value. And also, this market, this camera is marketed mainly for professional photographers. And I guess they didn't know how popular it would become uh, overall and with the mainstream. But uh, in those days when pretty much all news came through uh, uh, traditional news agencies, newspapers, magazines, and things like that, and uh, the camera was a fundamental part of uh, any news organization, they were willing to spend more money on high-quality equipment. It wasn't until 1963 that uh, the Nikon F, I guess, gained worldwide acclaim. And this was when it was used on the American expedition to uh, the top of Mount Everest. America sent a team of uh, 20 people on this expedition and uh, 20 Nikon Fs went along with them. And this expedition, I guess, was organized partly by the National Geographic magazine. And it's quite a big deal in those days. It wasn't every day that uh, anyone climbed Mount Everest. You know, nowadays there are at least a thousand people on any day in the climbing season trying to get to the top of Mount Everest. Back in those days, it was a, a really big deal. And in 1963, it was a much harder thing to do. Uh, they, you know, they didn't have the, the technology, of course, uh, that they have today. And during this expedition, uh, one person died uh, trying to uh, attempt climbing to the summit. It was a big enough deal that uh, after the expedition was successfully completed, that uh, President Kennedy met with the uh, expeditioners. And uh, the National Geographic Society awarded them its highest honor. And after the success, uh, these cameras had in that expedition. Uh, they became the, the standard workhorse for National Geographic magazine and continue to do so and largely all the way until today. I didn't know this when I was a kid, when I was a huge fan of National Geographic magazine. I, I read them like crazy, and that's because in those days, uh, you know, where we lived, we didn't have much to see on television, and for a lot of the time when I was a kid, you know, my parents weren't very much into TV, nor my grandparents, so they just had an old black and white thing, which uh, you know, occasionally my grandmother watched soap operas on. And of course, there was no internet, and the only place I could see the world was either at the library at school or through National Geographic magazines. And in those days, I, I always thought that uh, Canon were the supplier of cameras for National Geographic magazine because usually the uh, inside covers of the magazine had advertisements for the Canon company. And I dreamed that one day I would be a photographer using a brand new Canon A1 camera to go out and take pictures for National Geographic magazine. Uh, sadly, that didn't happen to me. Uh, you know, uh, unfortunately, most of us have to uh, uh, you know, do what we have to do rather than we, what, what we want to do. Uh, but I can't complain because though I am not a photographer for National Geographic magazine, uh, yeah, life hasn't been bad to me. So, uh, but uh, that was uh, that was the big deal with me in those days. And had I known that uh, Nikon were the uh, official uh, camera of uh, National Geographic photographers, I would have, of course, gone with that. Uh, Nikon, besides uh, being to the, the top of Mount Everest in 1963, went to a lot of other places. This became pretty much the standard camera of um, uh, war correspondents uh, during the Vietnam War uh, who carried it into combat and other places. Uh, the camera was carried uh, in expeditions and explorations of other parts of the world because uh, in the 1960s there were still parts of the world which were largely unexplored, uh, hard as that might seem to imagine nowadays. Uh, eventually to the point where these cameras were carried into space. And the final variation of the Nikon F is called the Apollo model, and uh, mainly because it was used by the uh, Apollo astronauts as well as uh, they also used Hasselblad cameras. You can tell an Apollo version of the Nikon F because it has a plastic tip on the self-timer and it has a plastic tip on the winding lever, but otherwise it's basically the same camera. Uh, 
What was really cool about these cameras when they were introduced is Nikon really wanted them to make the most of the lenses which it uh, had decided to design. And you have to keep in mind that in the 1950s, Nikon hadn't actually designed any uh, lenses for the ca these cameras. It just had ideas for lenses. But they decided to make uh, a foundation for their lens system, which would uh, fit with whatever their designers could come up with. And the, the heart of this design was the lens mount. Uh, we know this as the, the Nikon F mount, which continues to be used by Nikon even to this day. <clears throat> Uh, but there was more to it than just the, the, the ability to mount you know, the, these particular lenses with this style of bayonet. What Nikon did with this is they made this an, an especially wide mount. It was 44 millimeters wide, which was uh, 2 millimeters wider than the standard uh, 42 at the time, and 10 millimeters larger than its rangefinder cameras. And what this meant was you could fit a much larger rear element in the lens, which would make it easier to mount fast lenses, and also faster telephoto lenses. And this was largely the reason that Nikon became uh, very popular with sports photographers, was their fast uh, uh, telephoto lenses, which were, which caught some of the, the greatest moments in sports uh, in the, the 60s, 70s, 80s, and, and uh, prob even up uh, till today. Uh, Probably the most legendary lens uh, Nikon made for sports photographers was the 300mm f2.0 ED lens, and the other being the 300 uh, or the 5300 ED zoom. These were ridiculously or ungodly expensive lenses back when they were made, and they were made mainly for shooting pros. And uh, if it weren't for this lens or this bayonet mount design, uh, they probably wouldn't have performed as well as they otherwise would have. Uh, in addition to the wide lens mount was something else which Nikon perfected or uh, added their to their design. And that was the focusing screen and field of view, which was 100% on these cameras. Uh, even today, not a lot of cameras have a 100% field of view. And what that means is when you look through the viewfinder, you see 100% of what the lens is actually seeing. And in most cameras, this is 90 something percent. And that's that's perfectly fine for most photography, and most people probably wouldn't notice the difference between, say, a 94% viewfinder and a 100% viewfinder. But for, I guess, the most in precision and the most in accuracy, 100% uh, is going to be the most suitable. Another thing which Nikon added to this camera, which was unique uh, at the time, was this kind of funny thing here on the lens, which uh, some people call rabbit ears. And this was designed to engage the light meter system, which Nikon had developed for the Nikon F. It attached to the top and front of the camera, and it caught up these rabbit ears. And as you would turn the focus or the aperture ring one way or the other, it would cause a sensor in the light meter to move. And the second sensor in the light meter engaged uh, the shutter speed dial. And the Nikon camera was the first uh, camera to use a light meter which could calculate with both the aperture and with the aperture and the shutter speed dial in combination. Uh, in the Nikon rangefinder cameras and other SLR cameras of the time, you were limited to uh, only having metering from uh, the shutter speed dial. And as you turn the shutter speed dial, the needle on the light meter would move and recommend the best aperture, and then you would set the aperture. Uh, by using these these dials in combination, you could use an EV system, and uh, you know, it, it was a quite a good system, even though it was a little bit cumbersome to attach you know, the clip-on light meter to this body. And that was done away with when Nikon finally interested in, let's see, uh, uh, released its new photomic finders, which were large, ugly, square, like child block things with a prism inside and a built-in uh, uh, built light meter, uh, which would engage uh, the aperture ring and the shutter speed ring. And uh, this was, of course, though it wasn't a, a very beautiful system, and it kind of took away from the, the, the aesthetic you know, value of the Nikon F camera. It was rugged and reliable and provided very accurate and precise metering information. Uh, my first Nikon F, which I bought, I don't know, uh, in the early 90s, I bought it used at a, a thrift store or something like that for $60. It had the old Photomic uh, uh, viewfinder on it with the original Mercury battery, which still worked. And I shot this camera for more than a year. And uh, I was shooting it and uh, putting the film away and not developing it. And then eventually I got rid of the camera. And about a year after that, I developed the film. And when I got the results, I was really amazed. And I regretted getting rid of the camera after that. I should have kept it. It was really a, a wonderful tool and took wonderful photographs.
Uh, this prism here, what a lot of people uh, in the West call the, the plain prism. Uh, in Japan, it's known as the eye level prism uh, uh, to distinguish it from the waist level prism. And this is the one, of course, which is the most popular. Uh, uh, it, it's cleaner, uh, but with this, uh, with this particular prism, of course, you are limited to full manual operation without any built-in light meter. That's perfectly fine. Uh, most serious photographers, uh, especially studio photographers and stuff, don't really rely much on the built-in light meters in their cameras, even today. Uh, most of them rely on uh, handheld or external light meters to give the most accurate, uh, I guess, uh, readings possible. Nowadays, we can buy handheld light meters quite reasonably. There's a lot of them for sale on eBay and places like that. And also, uh, you can get a pretty good uh, light meter app for your smartphone, which uh, works probably better than the, the original light meters which were fitted to these cameras, and also allow you to be a little bit more creative in the light metering than you can be with the original ones. There are some weaknesses to this camera. There aren't many of them, and the, it, they aren't common weaknesses, but the, the most obvious one which I come across in this camera is a uh, deterioration of the prism in the viewfinder. <clears throat> this is uh, an issue mainly from the, the protective foam, which fits uh, underneath the brass top cover and the glass prism. There's foam put across the top of this to kind of protect from cracks and also to uh, insulate from vibration. But unfortunately, this uh, foam breaks down over time and causes a chemical reaction with the reflective coating on the prism and can make it deteriorate. And this makes big black blotches or small lines visible in the viewfinder. Uh, this camera had uh, this issue when I got it and I solved it by removing the prism and putting a clean one in, which I found in another camera. Uh, another issue which these cameras have is uh, an issue with the mirror. And what happens is when you uh, fire the shutter in the camera, the mirror doesn't travel all the way up to the top. It, it comes up most of the way to the top, but not all the way, and this can cause uh, uh, capping uh, in your uh, images. And sometimes it's not uh, something which happens every time you use it. It's an intermittent problem, so maybe one out of every three or four photos will have like a, the, the top will be darker than it should be because the mirror didn't go all the way up. Uh, this is not unfortunately not a very easy problem to fix. Normally you would replace it by just replacing the mirror box with one which has a, a better spring and a, a better mechanism, less worn mechanism. And the last issue which these cameras have are sticky or uh, a very off time slow shutter speeds. Uh, if you remove the bottom cover here, you'll see an internal bottom cover which is held on by four screws. If you remove these four screws, this plate comes off and you'll see some of the mechanism here for the, the flash sink and also for adjusting the shutter, uh, shutter uh, rollers and such. And uh, through the holes which are within the mechanism, under underneath, between uh, the mirror and this mechanism here is the slow speed escapement and sometimes a few drops of uh, a solvent or naphtha or lighter fluid will clean this up to where it will start working within spec again. About half the time this works, uh, half the time it doesn't. Uh, the other half of the time, if you do it two or three more times, it starts to clean up better and works better. And sometimes as soon as the solvent dries, it just it just starts sticking again. So uh, your mileage may vary when it comes to doing this repair or you know to, to get the slow speed escapement. The proper way to do it, of course, is to remove it from the camera, but that's a little bit complicated to do in this particular camera. Normally it's a very reliable system, but sometimes uh, you know I see it happen. If you have the bottom cover of the the camera off and you're looking at this plate here you might notice that yours has a couple of holes on one side drilled in the bottom and that means that your camera I, th I think on this side here was adapted to use a, a motor drive uh, the Nikon F has the distinction of being the first camera 35 millimeter camera which uh, came with a reliable motor drive there were other motor drives which were on the market at the time or in development at the time and they weren't quite as good uh, I had a Leica uh, MOT, which stands for motor, uh, which was a motor-driven uh, Leica rangefinder camera based on, you know, based on the M4. And it was a cool-looking black paint Leica camera. Unfortunately, the motor drives were very unreliable. And uh, uh, the one I had is kind of a big, ugly thing, which says it's made in New York. And while it made the camera look really ugly, uh, it didn't do much uh, for uh, you know, taking pictures rapidly. 
they have the, of course, rapid winders that uh, Tom Abramson made. Uh, uh, Tom actually brought me one from Canada here to Japan on, on his last visit here before he died. Uh, it was very nice of him to bring it to me. And uh, also the, the Lake of It M uh, trigger winders. Uh, here in Japan recently, people have taken the uh, F36 uh, motor drive and they've kind of modified it to fit a trigger winder. I bought one of these a few years ago and I found it very reliable and uh, much easier to use than the motor drive and also it made the camera look pretty cool. I, I, I like that system. Uh, I, I really love the Nikon F. Uh, this one here is an especially nice and well-worn model. I had a pair of these. Uh, I have this one and I had another one which had a big dent on the top. And from what I heard from the guy I got these from, I got them from uh, a shop outside uh, Tokyo here. And these were bringbacks from the Vietnam War or something like that. And uh, the other one had a bit of red mud and stuff inside of it, supposedly from Vietnam. I ended up selling that one to a collector and I've kept this one for myself. And uh, so far, uh, it's been a very rugged, reliable, and I think a very good looking camera. The wonderful thing about this camera, which a lot of people won't realize, is that uh, this Nikon F mount really is useful and universal. This is the original uh, lens to this camera, uh, which has about the same amount of wear and the serial numbers with proper range for this particular model. It's really well and beat up, but uh, the glass is still quite nice because Nikon used really good quality coatings on their glass to protect them from scratches. Uh, things like haze and fungus are a little bit difficult to infect these lenses compared to, say, the, the Canon lenses of the days, which were, were very prone to that stuff. But you can easily fit a, a later model AIS lens like this one here. Uh, it clips right on, still has the rabbit ears on the top. Uh, this is the 28mm f2.8 AIS, which was probably Nikon's best 28mm manual focus lens. Uh, what, this is a lens which I love to shoot on film and digital. And for those who uh, have uh, newer model cameras, uh, you can still use uh, autofocus lenses on these cameras, at least the D-type. You can tell the D-type because they have this kind of lip here on the edge, which would engage the light meter on the uh, uh, later uh, film and digital cameras and you would operate this the same way as you would uh, the normal manual lenses. You can just turn the aperture ring back and forth manually and then focus the lens on the front here. That's the really cool thing about the Nikon F is that uh, uh, pretty much anything but the newest uh, Nikon lenses will, will work properly on it. Uh, for myself, <clears throat> I really like this old 50 millimeter F2 lens. Uh, I wish it were the nine blade one, which came out in uh, 1959. I'm on the hunt for one of those, and I hope to, to get one one of these days, because uh, supposedly the performance is a little bit better on it, but uh, the standard one which came with this camera is nothing to laugh at. Uh, I don't have a lot much more to say about this camera. Uh, there isn't much, uh, anything I would have to say about it would be really wonderful. So uh, the best you can take from this video is that this is a really good camera. If you want something which is absolutely reliable uh, and absolutely takes wonderful photographs, you can't really go wrong with the legendary Nikon F. Anyway, uh, thank you very much for watching, and I hope you tune in again soon.